All right, um, so I'm going to talk for the next 50 minutes uh, with, um, with a bunch of examples, and Iftah will come back for the last 50 minutes after people get more caffeinated. Um, so, good. Uh, let's remember where we were. We said, imagine Alice and Bob share a, a partially secret uh, string W, which, uh, let's not worry about the source of that string, but there, there are many situations when this happens. Um, and they want to they wanna agree on a fully random string R, and we said extractors are great for that. They convert min entropy to randomness. Um, and if Eve knows something about the string, then you know, we, can still, we can still kick her out. But sort of what is the right value here? Um, you know, we started with, let's say, a uniformly random string W, right? So it was perfectly good. It's not that it was a bad string to begin with, it was good. But then maybe Eve learned, let's say, it's Hemingway. How many bits of mid entropy are there now? It's not an, obvi right? it's not an obvious question, because the Hemingway is zero, then there's no entropy left. You know exactly what the string is. And, but then how, how, how do you deal with this? Um, Okay, so it depends on the specific knowledge that it has. Um, and so if we don't know how much mid-entropy there is, then how do we know sort of which extractor to apply, how far to truncate? Because you, you multiply your truncate. That's the, that's the way to think about extractors. Um, and I want to sort of point out before I answer this question is that there are really two different um, views. Um, oh, wow, these things really burn in. You can see the previous slide, right? So this is a... If, if you wonder, for those of you who work on, on, on physical security, if you wonder if secure erasure exists, uh, that's, that's your answer right there. Um, okay, good. So, so there are two views of extractors that sort of existed in parallel in the literature for a little while until, until they got merged and people realized that they're the same thing. One view is that maybe Alice and Bob never even had good randomness. They had poor quality randomness because they just can't flip random coins. Um, and this sort of comes from the randomized algorithms community, de-randomization community. If you don't have good random coins, then what you can do, you can extract to get good, good quality randomness that's indistinguishable from uniform. And another view of extractors is that you had good randomness, but then Eve got, got her hands on it, and now it's not such good randomness anymore because she learned something about it. Uh, and now it gets indistinguishable from uniform, even given the leakage that went to Eve. Right. Those are actually the same thing, but uh, the, the, it wasn't obvious for a little while at least. Uh, but it's also sort of not obvious, how do you measure entropy in this case? This is the average entropy that Evgeny mentioned um, that I'm going to talk about. Before we do that, uh, one observation, um, which is sort of a, a chain rule, but not really a, a chain rule. It's a chain rule conditioned on one specific event. That mean entropy does not degrade by more than the surprise. If Eve learned something unsurprising, then mean entropy does not degrade a lot. If she learned something very surprising, then right, the entropy of this one specific point that she learned is very high, so you subtract a lot and not much left. Right? If I give you a string and say it's Hemingway to zero, but it was uniform, that's a super surprising event, so the entropy decreases a lot. Okay, so uh, if, if, right, does this make sense? If you condition a specific event, the entropy goes down by the, by the log of the probability of that event. Um, so we can sort of measure this for each value that Eve knows, but we don't know what Eve knows. So, uh, it, yes, but not during a talk. Like you need, you need, you need, you need a minute uh, and a piece of paper, and then, and then it comes, and it becomes clear. It's just the maximum, right? So, how much can the maximum degrade? You're conditioning, you're dividing. That's it. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so, we'd like to sort of define the average version. Uh, I already said let's start with the uniform. So, capital W is the distribution of lowercase w, right? So, if, if capital W is uniform. Uh, why is the Hamming weight? Okay, so let's say, you know, um, the, the probability that the Hamming weight is exactly half is roughly this. Uh, in that case, the entropy goes, you know, by, by the log of that, which, which is half log n. So you lose about half log n bits. So if you had a 1,000 bit string, you lose, ten, you lose 5 bits by learning that the, it's, it's entropy, it, it's, it's half the Hamming weight. The Hamming weight is half. On the other hand, right, the probability, if you know that uh, the Hamming weight is full, then you subtract exactly n, there's zero entropy left. This formula makes sense. That's, that's all I'm trying to say here. This formula exactly matches what you think it should, it should do. Um, how do you do this on average? Remember the sort of functional definition of min entropy. It's the log, the probability that the adversary predicts something. 
So we're going to do that in the average case also. You give the adversary a y, and then it's trying to predict your w. You can measure this probability. You can take the log. That will be our notion of average entropy. It's convenient. Um, so what's the probability of predicting w given y? Well, OK. Um, you can take expectation over all possible y's of the maximum of, of, of this distribution, specific condition on a specific y. So notice that the maximum is over w, the expectation is over y. The adversary has no control over y. y is given. I find out the Hamming weight. And then you get to predict w. So you go for the best. Um, and then, of course, you take log because you want to measure entropy in, in, uh, in bits. You know, log is just always there. But important to take a log after, not before. If you think about what happens if you take the log before, let's just do this, right? It's not the average of mid So unlike the Shannon case, average entropy in the Shannon case is average of entropies. Average entropy in the min case is not average of entropies. Right? So for example, if you have half the time entropy is 0 and half the time entropy is 1,000, what are the chances you predict? They're about half, right? Because half the time entropy is 0, you predict. You're not going to average 0 and 1,000 to get 500 bits of entropy. There's no 500 bits of entropy. There's 1. Because you predict with probability half. So take, take the log after you average. And that's, uh, uh, that, that's, that's sort of a difference from Shannon. But I really, sort of these details are less important than the functional definition, I think. The min entropy morally is the probability you predict. And so that's, that's the thing you want to think about. Good. Questions here? Does the definition make sense? OK. Good. So the definition we're going to work with, and, and this definition is sort of convenient because it allows us to not worry about the specific value of y, but talk about right, the distributions of y. Um, uh, actually, I don't know yeah. What you mean. It's not a question. It's more like an interpretation of your h and w given y. Because from the point of view of y, he has a realization of y, right? So he has a realization of y, but I may not know what. Well, so uh, I think we think about uh, other are the security situations, right? My, my key is a realization. Why am I taking averages over all possible keys? Because, uh, no, right? Yeah, that makes sense from the point of view of W, but that's not from the point of view of Y. Ah, OK. I, I see what you're saying. Uh, I will give me, give, me, give me a slide or two, and then we'll see if it still makes sense, OK? Um, so first of all, there is, this, there is this version of a chain rule that is not hard to prove, except notice that you subtract, uh, um, right, so in the Shannon case, they would all be the same age, but, but here um, you subtract the max entropy from the min entropy, which is not so good. You're subtracting potentially more. But, but at least you know how, at most how much you subtract, right? So you're subtracting no more than n bits. Um, okay, so, so there is this version of a chain rule. It's not hard to prove. Um, so let's think about what conditional min entropy is good for average min entropy, as we called it. Uh, we can still talk about passwords. Right. What is the security if the average of an entropy of my password is this? Well, it's exactly the probability pre the adversary predicts it, so I can still measure security here. So if we play the game where I choose a password and you get to find out its Hamming weight, I know the chances that you will then guess my password. I just subtract the, the number of bits that are needed to represent the Hamming weight. Um, the same message authentication uh, uh, code that I showed earlier will still work. The probability that the adversary will um, uh, will will break my message authentication code right uh, is is still what it was before. Average min entropy minus uh, minus half the length. Um, and uh, randomness extraction also works in this case. You um, if you have a W about which Eve knows something, but the average min entropy is still k then the result is uh, still going to be epsilon close to uniform given y. Okay, for the message authentication to work, what uh, do you need about uh, you, could, you just need the, 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 the mean entropy of the uh, of authentication itself? The, be, uh, so this is a so this is a specific message authentication code that I showed oh, a specific, a specific, specific one. You can actually claim general theorems, but not on this slide. Uh, you, you're going to have to subtract sort of the entropy deficiency from. You, you do all the work assuming it's uniform, and then you subtract the entropy deficiency. 
Does that make sense? Um, so uh, the point is that the same proof that works for, for fixed min entropy now works for average min entropy also. So I think that that should sort of answer the question a little bit of why it's OK to take the average. Because we can still measure probabilities of adversarial success. We can still measure distance from uniform. I'm, I'm sort of confused. <laughs> Sorry, so that matters. I mean, what is the definition of security there in the second bullet? The definition of security in the second bullet is the probability that the adversary successfully modifies the message and the, the tag in a way that's undetectable by the other side. So it's a probability. The definition of security is probability, ultimately. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And and the, back to the privacy amplification setting where we didn't know what Eve knew. Uh, right. We're now okay. We know exactly how much to extract. We extract the up to the average min entropy. Um, okay. Uh, let's move on from. Yes, minus, minus three bits. Yes, Salil? It's minus three bits, right? I think that's what you proved. So, some, some, yeah, basically the same parameters. For the specific, for the leftover hash lemma, it's exactly the same parameters. And all extractors, if you're agnostic to what extractor you're using, then I think you lose either three bits or a factor of three in epsilon or something stupidly small like that. A strong extractor. I don't know if you, yeah. I, I, OK, so let's go to a slightly different setting now, because I think it's going to come up again and again uh, later in the week. Um, Alice and Bob have two different strings, and they still want to agree on a common key. And um, let's say it's close in some metric or, or, or some, some other notion of closeness that's not a metric, doesn't matter. Um, what typically happens in that setting is that Alice is going to send some kind of uh, error correcting information, often called sketch, excuse me, uh, to, to Bob. Um, and then also apply an extractor. And what Bob is going to do is, um, you know, sort of using the sketch, recover the original W and also apply the same extractor. Right. And in this setting, how do you know how much you can extract? Yeah. So the problem we're trying to solve is Alice and Bob have different Ws, but they're close, let's say close in the Hamming distance for, for simplicity. And now they want to still agree to the, on the key agreement. We're still in key agreement mode, right? They still want to, but now there's, there's a Hamming distance between the two things. They're not identical. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you some error correcting bits. Let's think, of, let's, if it's easiest for you to think of a systematic code and send the sort of the tail of the systematic code. Um, and Bob is going to recover. Yeah, and the goal is still the same, to, to agree on a key R. Now the question is, how much can you, how, how long a key can you agree on in this setting? So you, you did a reconciliation, and now you want to do, so the setting is they have W, W prime, mm -hmm. and uh, that is not far from it. We do uh, some key reconciliation. Mm -hmm. A uniform key, a nearly uniform key, exactly. And the question is, how much can I extract, right? Yeah. Does it work even if uh, you know, they interact with each other and the sketch is a function of W and W prime? Uh, so yes, uh, you have to be careful with bit counting, but, but yes. Yes, uh, it also works in the interactive setting. Uh, I'll, well, what, I'll tell you exactly what works. Give, give me a second, right? Um, well, so how long an R can you extract? Well, we know that you can extract up to the average entropy, right? Uh, average min entropy, basically. What averaged on what? Averaged on all knowledge of Eve. What does Eve know? She knows some prior information already about W W prime, and now she also got this information S, the error correcting information. And so now we have to condition on both random variables, and the entropy chain rule now extended slightly says that basically you're going to have to lose the length of the information you exchange. If you send around five bits, so, so min entropy, Eve's min entropy conditioned on her knowledge was a thousand, right? All she knew was something that, that left her with a thousand bits of entropy, and now you send five bits to do error correction. Well, very unrealistic. You send a hundred bits to do error correction. You've got 900 bits left. Why is still prior information, just like it was on the previous slide? 
And S is the new information that you've got because you have to reconcile the errors. Right? In the previous slide, there was no error reconciliation. She just had to, she just knew some why. And now she, she has additional knowledge that came from the fact that you were publicly discussing stuff about your strings. You said, you know, the, the XOR of all the bits of my string is, is one to Bob, so that Bob could correct. And, and uh, now Eve also knows that fact. And the secrecy is still in terms of the probability? The secrecy is still, well, so the, the secrecy is in terms of the key you can extract that is indistinguishable from uniform, right? So where we're extracting, um, remember if we have k bits of min entropy, we can extract almost k bits, as close to k as we can get, uh, that how close depends on how close we want to be to the uniform and the extracted value, right? Does that? Yes. Yeah, okay. So we can still extract as, you know, just as many bits as before. You just have to measure entropy carefully. You have to measure entropy. Can, you know, we can extract up to the full entropy, which is uh, what the starting entropy was, entropy of W conditioned on Y, minus how many bits you sent. So the cost of information reconciliation protocol is equal to the number of bits this protocol exchanges. And it's easy to see given the chain rule. Right. You're gonna, the extracted key length is going to have to decrease by exactly the number of bits you exchange. And the proof is very simple once you have this chain rule. <laughs> Even if it's interactive, right? Because S is still a random variable and so this conditioning chain rule still works. Uh, oh, uh, no, so I, I'm not saying it's, sorry, why is it impossible to extract the left-hand side of the lemma? Yeah. It is, I'm just bounding, the, it, it's exactly what's possible to extract, I'm just bounding it. I mean, that's the only way I know how to bound it. It's not that you extract the right-hand side, you extract the left-hand side. I can extract as much entropy as there is in here, but how much is that? I don't know. I mean, ultimately I have to program an extractor, right? Somebody has to run it, and so I have to decide how much that is, and I'm going to bound it by this. I'm going to say subtract whatever you sent. If you send 100 bits of error correcting information, subtract that off and extract 100 bits less. And that's still okay. Mm -hmm. In the spirit of asking questions. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh, even the previous results that you had before you got the S in, they still are from the point of view of the W, I think. I mean, the thing is, uh, the security and all this, this question is what do I believe, uh, whether I believe my password is secure. It, but your definition doesn't seem to capture the idea of what the adversary sees as. Good. So Exactly. So if your beliefs are wrong, then, then you're in trouble. And that's no, sort no, of a, right? That. I think it's a question is, from the point of view of the adversary, uh -huh. your password might look like it's very bad, but you might think that it's good because you have to do the probability differently from the point of view of the adversary. That's really what I'm thinking. Yes, I, I, and I think that's, that's an important question. So you're sort of assuming some kind of generative process. My password was generated by the world or by me or by, by whatever, right? Yeah, the In this way, and the adversary, ha and you're taking... And you're taking the probability over that generative yeah. process, yeah. right? Not over a specific instance. And that's... Yeah, but, but uh, the adversary might also do the same thing, take a probability over a generative process, but he would evaluate the scheme differently because he wouldn't be averaging over his own on some bits and half. So there must be some other quantity other than your angel for the W given Y, which is appropriate to judging the protocol from the point of view of the adversary. Okay. So think of it this way. Um, if I'm, I'm marketing a particular scheme, right? You're going to have to decide whether to buy it or not before you know what the adversary knows, because there's no adversary yet. You haven't bought it yet, right? So at the time you buy it, it's a reasonable claim to make. What's the probability that if I buy it, I'm screwed? No, I'm not arguing right? that. But then but ex post facto, once the adversary knows something, the probability can increase or decrease. That's sort of what you're saying, right? No, once you use the scheme. There must be some other quantity that you want to define, mm -hmm. which uh, explains how valuable the scheme, how bad the scheme looks from the point of view of the adversary. Involves the adversary doing an average over the conditional ensemble of the password given what the adversary knows. So, given a specific instantiation of what you know. So, so the point is that, that there isn't a Y yet. When you're buying the scheme, this fixed Y doesn't exist. And so that, so I think this is exactly the right notion. Given the Y, the adversary takes a maximum, right? So that is the ensemble of W given what he knows. Okay. Um, Good. I'm going to do sort of one more uh, plug for entropy, and then I think we'll move on to computational analogs. Uh, let's say you have a more complex protocol. I'm not going to even try to explain how to build one, um, where Eve is now active. 
right? So there, any message that Alice and Bob exchange can also be modified by Eve. Everything we did before, Eve just observed stuff but stayed, um, stayed quiet. And they still want to agree on, a, on, a, on R. Of course, denial of service is always possible, so we're going to relax the goal. It's R or I give up. Uh, there are various complex protocols there. I'm not going to say how, but, but the nice thing is that analysis tools are sort of, um, you already know a lot of them. You can count entropies based on the number of bits observed by Eve. You can still do that. Every, every bit that Alice or Bob sends reduces the entropy of their secret by one. You can still do that. Um, if some value is greater than 50% unknown to Eve, you can still use it as a message authentication code key, as a MAC key, just like what we had before. And in fact, these protocols do that. They, they say, well, this is, Eve is going to know something, but it's good enough to use as a Mac key. It's not uniform, but it's good enough to use as a Mac key. And if some value is uniform, even if it's public, as long as it was uniformly generated and independently of other stuff, you can use it as an extractor key. And how much can you extract? You know that by counting entropies. You can extract up to this average of entropy minus 2 log 1 over epsilon bits, where epsilon is the proximity you want to uniform in your ultimate extracted key. These analysis tools persist even if the protocol is very complex. And they're kind of the only thing that saves us from insanity in these complex protocols. Um, okay. Good. One plug uh, for min entropy without extractors, but it's a very short plug. Um, right? So extractors kind of are, are, are a very general tool. Um, if, if you have an application that requires uniform randomness, and all you have is min entropy, Extract, get nearly uniform randomness, the performance doesn't degrade much. Right? So, so if the extracted value is, is, is epsilon close to uniform, performance degrades by at most epsilon. But in fact, this is not the only way. Um, and as I said, right, so, so, so we know that to do this, you're going to have to lose this amount. Um, you need a lot, you need somewhat more min entropy. And if you don't want to lose this amount, then it's possible, um, it's possible to do that for specific applications. And there's a series of works uh, by some, some of the people in the audience and others that sort of shows you how to do this for specific applications. I don't know if uh, you guys can talk about this. I can talk about this. Yeah, I'm gonna, uh, no. yeah, probably, not. probably not. Okay, so I'm just going to do a plug. Extractors are not the only way. <laughs> okay, uh, but extractors do sort of give you things in general for specific applications. You don't have to. For example, for message authentication, you don't have to extract. You can just use it as is. We know that min entropy itself is good enough. Huh? Naive question. So, how, how, how should I think about your um, uh, squiggle sub epsilon? Oh, oh, oh. The C's and the S's and all that are defined earlier. Good. Squiggle sub epsilon in this case means uh, variation distance, statistical distance. In this, without, in, computational restrictions. without computational restrictions for now. I have not done anything computational yet. Uh, yeah, so it's just uh, if you're trying to distinguish the two distributions. Yeah, yeah. Good. It'll happen in a second. Okay, so. Uh, let's go to the computational analogs. Um, and this is the notion that Iftah already defined, so I'll remind you. Um, again, this is min entropy. We will say that something called Hill entropy, after the authors who first defined it, um, is greater than or equal to k. And uh, there's a couple more parameters. If there exists a distribution that has true entropy k, right? and itself is close. And now the squiggle delta s means something different. Okay, what does squiggle delta s mean? There are two parameters. We're going to say that there, these two distributions are going to be distinguished by a circuit. We're going to live in the circuit world for, for this talk. Um, the circuit is size at most s, at most s gates, let's say at most s wires, whichever. Um, and there's some uh, maximum advantage with which the circuit will distinguish. And so these two parameters, there's a probability and a size, essentially. Probability of distinguishing. I'm sorry? Maximum size of distinguishing? Uh, I can take a much bigger circuit and still distinguish it. No, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm limiting. What? I'm saying for all circuits of size up to this, their probability is at most this. Yeah? So advantage is variation distance, but variation distance is for all circuits, regardless of their size, right? So it's even computationally unbounded, while this is computationally bounded. Yeah. Uh, some of us here, uh -huh. can you explain for us what the distinguishing circuit is? Oh, perfectly. Yes, I can. Good. Good question. Let me draw a picture, okay? Um, so first of all, the circuit is a convenient 
an, an, an unrealistic model of computation, but uh, think of it as a function as can be expressed in a bunch of Boolean gates. Okay? And so you have this, uh, this thing that has you know, up to S Boolean gates with clever wiring in it, and it's trying to tell apart one of two things. It is either in the world where sample, so, so it gets a sample, and it outputs um, W versus Z. It's trying to decide where it is. Okay. Um, and the sample, okay, now it's in one of two worlds. It doesn't know what's behind this wall. The sample comes out of this wall either from W or from Z. It doesn't know. Let's say half-half. Okay, half the time from W, half the time from Z. And this thing has to be correct. Delta is how correct it is. Well, not quite. You know, you're going to be correct with probability a half because you don't have to do anything to be correct with probability a half. So half plus delta is how correct it is. Okay, so correct with probability at most one half plus delta. What's what's half right? Um, half time w, half times that. Yeah? Uh, there's an equivalent view which you, you can, uh, I don't know if it's worth, okay, let me, let me try to say an equivalent view. It's not half time w, half time z. In one world, it's w. In the other world, it's z, and you subtract the probability that it says w from, from each other. Here it says w with some probability, here it says w with some lower probability. What's the difference? That's, that's an equivalent view to this one. Okay, good. Thanks for asking. Sunil. And maybe it's Yes, yes, sorry, thank you. S is, S is the amount of time it takes. So if we think of an ideal computer as evaluating a Boolean gate at a time, then S is the amount of time this whole thing is going to take to evaluate, right? So program size. Um, or not program size, so computation time, exactly. Um, ow. So this, this thing is our distinguisher D. It's called distinguisher because it's trying to, to distinguish two things. No, one, one time sample. But the distributions are, are known. There's no, I mean, it, it, whatever you can fit into S, S gates, whatever information you can fit about W and Z, you can fit in, uh, in, into this thing, right? So it has information somehow. But, but I mean, the distributions have may be very complex, so having access to a separate right. generation is going to be difficult. No, so, so, no there's, there's no such thing. There's no, in fact, Right, so in fact, uh, Z may not, so typically you think of W as, as being sort of efficiently generatable. Z might not even be generatable in any, in any efficient sense. Uh, good. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to say that my distribution is, so, um, Let's see, you're my adversary. You're computationally bounded because you only have so much time in your life, right? So I'm going to say, I really should be using truly random keys. But since you're computationally bounded, if I use keys that are indistinguishable from truly random, it's good enough. Because if you could break something, then you would distinguish. Does that make sense? So instead of having something with Right, so Z is, is my distribution with true entropy, but W is my distribution that maybe has very little true entropy, but is indistinguishable from Z for you, and therefore it's just as good <coughs> if you're my adversary, right? And so if, if all my adversaries are bounded by this running time, then I'm okay. If I underestimated the running time of my adversaries, then I may be screwed. Yes. Uh, yeah, there, so, so there, yeah, there, there's a, yes, uh, or is that somehow automatically efficient? 
no, so, so it's actually, it's, it's not an easy question. We say for all adversaries, but in reality, we don't have all adversaries. We only have adversaries that we have, right? And, and so, for example, I'll give you one example. There are such, there's such things as collision-resistant functions. They're public. There exists an adversary who knows a collision in a mathematical sense, but we don't think such an adversary exists on this earth. Right, so there's a computational cost to creating such an adversary. We don't, we don't, right, so, so it is worth it and people do think about it. I think Salil may have a different answer to that. Yeah, it sounds like it's getting a little bit of a difference between uh, uniform and non-uniform models of computation. So if you think of a, a Turing machine model, no, but, know, yeah, so uh, sometimes all these definitions are done with respect to uniform models of computation, where there is nothing, you can't really hardwire anything but uh, the constant size program that you have for your algorithm. So you can't really hardwire information about W and Z. And then sometimes when one uses those notions, you the definitions do start to incorporate things like allowing, giving Oracle access to samples from the distribution to model the way that the adversary might have gotten some prior information. And then you ask what's the kind of basically getting at what's the cost of constructing the distinguishing circuit. But things become a lot more complicated uh, with those definitions, and so more common people adopt these non-uniform models of computation where uh, it just notationally and definitionally becomes simpler. Yes, good point. Thank you. Good. Um, okay, so this is the definition. I want to stick with it for a little bit. Um, I just moved it up. Uh, so let's see. Once you have a distinguishability, as I was uh, already saying in response to a question, that there's you 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 get a lot of mileage immediately because um, if right if you have an adversary and you know that if you only had true min entropy you would be okay. Well, you substitute this fake min entropy hill entropy. If the adversary can do something new bad, then the adversary can distinguish Z from W, and it shouldn't be possible. That's sort of the, the entire proof. Um, so, so as an example, right, a pseudo-random generator, a, a very, very basic cryptographic construct, like what does it do? It takes a uniform seed, expands it to a large string, long string. The min entropy of this string is still the same as the size of the seed, because it's a deterministic algorithm. You can't, you can't get any more than that. But the string is indistinguishable from uniform, so it has full Hill entropy. So this is sort of a very, very basic example because we don't really use all the power of Hill entropy. We just use the, you know, n bits of Hill entropy, exactly as many as, as, we, um, as we have. Um, and we get something that then can be used anywhere. So if anywhere you wanted to use truly random strings, you can use pseudo-random strings. Why? Because if you notice the difference, then you are a distinguisher. Um, and when I teach crypto, I emphasize this is well beyond crypto, right? If you're doing a Monte Carlo simulation, use pseudo-random strings. Uh, because because uh, random strings are hard to get. Um, an extractor argument again, right? So suppose you had something going into an extractor that didn't have much true entropy, but at least had Hill entropy K. So it was indistinguishable from something that has true entropy. Um, remember, extractors give us something that's epsilon close, but now we also have this delta parameter here, which is the quality of the distinguisher. The result is going to be now epsilon plus delta close to uniform, as long as your you know, your instruments have no more complexity than s. If you cannot look at the string for more than s time, then to you it will look epsilon plus delta close to uniform. Epsilon from the extractor, delta from this. And this is a triangle inequality argument that's not hard to uh, make formal. Does that have to use, use something about the size of circuit, or? Yes, you have technically you have to, which I'm, I was trying to sweep under the rug, but you didn't let me. Um, the extractor takes some amount of time and you, that adds to the complexity of s. You have to subtract it back. If you're thinking of the simple extractor constructions, it, it, it's nothing. If you're thinking of more complex extractor constructions, it, it may be relevant. Yeah. Good. Good point. Um, a couple of variations that I want to mention um, with the order of quantifiers that, that become important in a little bit. How much time do I have until the break? 15 minutes, okay, good. 
Um, so let's let's sort of un unwrap this indistinguishability a little bit. Uh, I'm just not not saying anything profound. I'm just unwrapping the definition. I'm saying um, we need z to have min entropy k, and for all distinguishers of size s, um, here's a slightly different view. This is the expected value of distinguisher output when it gets an input from w. This is the expected value of distinguisher outputs when it gets an input from z. And these two are plus or minus delta with each other. Think of a distinguisher as outputting a bit 0, 1. It's equivalent to this view. It's not, not hard to, to show if you have three minutes and a, and a pencil. Um, so we're saying that whatever distinguisher does here is going to be roughly the same as what it does here, plus or minus delta. Um, OK. We can now switch the order of quantifiers and say, what if we don't have a universal z that fools all distinguishers, but for every distinguisher, we can fool it? Every distinguisher of size s gets fooled by some distribution z. I just switched this order, right? Didn't do anything here. Um, OK, it's a weaker notion, but it's actually still good enough if you think about uh, many applications like extraction. You're going to extract a string, and it works to extract this string, because whatever distinguisher you have, you could have pretended that for that distinguisher, you use that distinguisher z. Right? For every d, there is a d. The extractor is going to fool every specific distinguisher by s pretending that it actually used zd instead of w. The distinguisher doesn't know any better. Okay. Um, and a weaker yet notion, yeah. I think it's actually very useful in cryptography. In fact, it's, it's useful most of the time. Okay. Um, it, it's just that it doesn't naturally come up. <laughs> if you have a pseudorandom generator, it's indistinguishable from uniform, and that's it. You, we, we don't have a good way to use it often, right? Um, because how do you build something for each distinguisher? It seems like a much harder task than building once and proving indistinguishability. But it's, um, it's good enough. Because any time in cryptography you have a specific adversary you're worried about, that adversary will be fooled. So that's good enough. Um, and then there's something that comes up in a, in a technical way, and I'm not going to explain how it comes up. Um, what if we only allow deterministic distinguishers? So now our, our entropy notion is even weaker. We're not fooling all distinguishers. We're only fooling deterministic ones, right? And what is the difference? The difference is that now we, you know, here, no matter what the randomness is, you still have the same z. But now here, for each distinguisher, you have a different z depending on the randomness that the distinguisher uses. So now you have an even weaker notion. And that one is not good enough for extraction anymore, because extractors need random seeds. But you can only fool a deterministic distinguisher, so, so it might not work. So um, this works for th this notion is defined for randomized distinguishers, as well, right? So you give me a randomized distinguisher, it'll the first thing it'll do it'll come up with random coins, right? But the z that will fool it does not depend on the random coins. While here, if you think of a deterministic distinguisher, you can take any randomized distinguisher, fix its coins, make it a deterministic one, and now you're allowed to make a different z depending on the random coins. And that's not good enough to prove that extraction works. Because extraction actually requires, right, the distinguisher gets to flip the coins of the, of the extractor seed. Uh, but there's a theorem that one can, so, so you can have as much Hill entropy as you have metric star entropy as long as you're willing to compromise your circuit size. I'm not going to specify the parameters. So you can convert this weak entropy to this strong entropy, but now, uh, you know, the weak entropy maybe uh, has to be against really big circuits in order for the strong entropy to work against relatively small circuits. So some, some cubic factor is the mm, way to think about it. Okay. Long computer. Um, and uh, there is actually a theorem. Are you going to talk about it? Okay. You're going to talk about it. Yeah. Okay. And Christoph is going to talk about a theorem that actually says that this this loss is necessary even to go from this step to this step. Okay, and, and okay. Good, so I know I'm throwing a lot of notions, but actually this one will be useful. 
Um, because again, I want to think about conditional, right? Uncon yeah. Unconditional entropy is very rarely interested in crypto because usually the adversary has some correlated information. And we usually want to talk about conditional entropy, right? If you think about sort of crypto settings, right? If your entropic secret is the Diffie-Hellman value, uh, then the observer knows the g to the a and g to the b. So it's conditional. If your entropic secret is a secret key, the observer knows some leakage of the secret key, right? If, the, if your entropic secret is a signature, the observer knows the public key. There's always something correlated that the observer knows in the cryptographic setting. Um, I, this one probably I don't want to explain. Sorry, I shouldn't have put it on the slide. Um, okay, so how does conditioning reduce Hill entropy? Right, for min entropy, we have this uh, nice result. This is for a specific value. This is not the average. Um, so the same holds for, uh, for uh, Hill entropy, almost. <coughs> not quite. Um, I'll explain why not quite. But there are two things that get worse, right? The amount of entropy gets reduced. OK, that makes sense. The quality of entropy also gets reduced. It's conveniently in a subscript, so you can't really notice it too much. But it actually is a big deal. The qual so if delta was the distinguishing advantage, how well the adversary could tell, now it gets reduced by the amount of surprise in the leakage. In addition to the quality, the quantity, uh, the quality and the quantity get reduced. Um, and actually, this formulation is just a reformulation of, of something known as the dense model theorem with a very long pedigree. This is just another way of seeing the same theorem in a, in a small formula. Okay. Uh, but this is not Hill entropy. This is actually this metric star thing that I talked about. So this very nice formula works for not such nice ent entropy. Metric star is, remember, the entropy where we only consider deterministic distinguishers. And for each deterministic distinguisher, you're allowed to make a separate indistinguishable distribution to fool that specific distinguisher. Okay. Uh -huh. the, the Yes, yeah, so this is a specific little y. This is the amount of surprise. It doesn't depend on the magnitude of the probability of the little y. It does not. Uh, the left hand side, well. It depends on the stochastic matrix and you will have a row in the matrix. Correct, and now what can I say about this row? I can say that a distinguisher of size s will not distinguish it better than with this probability. Sorry, uh, yeah. The distinguisher of size s will not distinguish it from a true min entropy distribution better than with this probability. The first term on the right hand side, huh? the first term on the right hand side involves W, which involves a lot of Y. That, that's fine, yes. So that's why you need the, that's why you need to have the probably one. Yeah, but the left hand side doesn't depend on yeah. the So the, how good is the bound is the question. Uh, oh how good is the bound? Yeah, because the right hand side depends on the marginal of Y, but the left hand side doesn't. So It does, yeah, so, so it does depend on the probability of y here. So what, what is the formula for this, for this expression? I think I'm, I'm not understanding Don't the question. No, just the yeah. of H sub delta S metric. Uh oh. So metric, okay, so, so there's, there's a bunch of stuff going on. This thing we, um, means that we're considering the kind of entropy defined as, as follows. For every deterministic distinguisher, let me go back, just so instead of saying words. Um, for every deterministic distinguisher of size s, there is another distribution with true entropy that is indistinguishable better than, and now this delta becomes delta over probability of y. Yeah? Um, so does the question? No, OK. All right, thanks. OK. So as I said, this is not for such nice entropy notion. It's not very convenient. But we know it can be converted, uh, thanks to Barak Shultu Vigderson and, and others, uh, to H Hill with a loss in the circuit size. That's what we noted from the previous slide. OK. Good. So um, we have some kind of chain rule. The, what, will, what happens, right, so after the convert, so delta gets worse, the indistinguishability gets worse, the circuit size gets worse, but the amount of entropy gets reduced by exactly the right thing. So it's. Uh, yeah, if you're thinking about polynomials, I mean, or you, have, or you make some really strong assumptions about the initial indistinguishability, right? Why? Strong assumptions are all the rage right now, so why, why limit yourself to polynomial side assumptions? <coughs> uh, 
right? Uh, yes, there, there, there are variants that switch this last. So this is this is our version of this uh, dense model. There are variants that that switch over the last to s. They're just not as pretty to state. The the nice thing about this is that this, there's no hidden big O's, hidden con. There's nothing here. This is this is exact, right? So that's why I like it. Yeah. Can you give a two sentence introduction to the dense model? Oh. Is it somehow related to Zen and so on? So so the the. This is, my ver this is my introduction to the dense model. In fact, this is the dense model theorem just stated differently. It says that, OK, so, so think of it this way. Um, Z is true entropy. W is a model of Z. Why is it a model? Because if you're computationally bounded, it doesn't look uh, any different, right? Now we subsample W by conditioning on, on Y. And we're saying it's still a model for something pretty good. It's a model for Z, Z conditioned on, yeah? So the conditioning is like the groups. The conditioning is like the groups. So I, I don't know what you're referring to, so probably, so do you know what? <laughs> Since you're on the dense model theorem here. Luca? Luca's here? Luca's here. In the number theoretic application, Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. In the number theoretic application, uh, let's see, Z is which one and W is which one? So which one's the actual high entropy? Uh, Z is high entropy. Okay. W is fake. Uh, so uh, W would be like the uniformly distributed on things that are kind of almost prime, uh, have no small prime factor, something along those lines. Uh, and those have some very strong pseudorandomness properties. Um, I guess going back to Hardy and Littlewood, and you can correct me if I'm messing this up. Um, and uh, so see. So the CRD that you so z is the integer. So I said w is the almost prime, and z is the integers. And now when you condition, the event you're conditioning on is an almost prime being a prime. So the primes are kind of a relatively dense subset of the almost primes. Um, and then the dense model theorem says that they look like a fairly dense subset of the integers. Um, and then one knows that Semiretti's uh, theorem holds for dense subsets of the integers, and that's how Green and Tau showed, or part of you know, how they showed, that the arbitrary long arithmetic regressions also hold in the prime numbers. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's good.